China could really use some legitimate strength in the global economy, but it's not coming. The Chinese, of course, are struggling with their own internal problems, so a genuine pickup from around the rest of the world would really come in handy here. But data point after data point shows only continuing and ongoing weakness and disappointment. Put yourself in the shoes of the Chinese. They're trying to struggle their way out of a real estate problem, financial issues, political intrigue. So a real boost from around the rest of the world, that strength that Western central bankers are always talking about, would really come in very handy here to try to stabilize the situation so that they can get their house in order, in some cases, literally. Essentially, use this external global economy as a crutch to get back on the right track. But neither of those are happening. Instead, as we see economic data point after economic data point continue to disappoint and continue to weaken, it's a reflection, first of all, of the global situation, global recession, it's not helping China. And second of all, pointing out how China's problems really are intractable. And what it leads to is a stimulus cycle of sorts. Essentially, China comes face to face with weakness in its own economy, largely due in part to the drag from the external sector. And what does it do? Well, it responds with stimulus. And that stimulus, of course, gets everybody excited, especially the Western media who say China is going to turn a corner because Beijing is now doing something about the economy. These Keynesian assumptions are deeply embedded, at least in the Western media, not so much in Beijing anymore. The idea that government spending, a government doing anything just for the sake of doing something is somehow stimulus. That aggregate demand and filling up the economy's missing gap with just blanket spending, deficit spending all the better, somehow that will lead to an economy rebounding and heading off into recovery. When time and again we see that's not the case. Because even if government spending was potentially successful, we don't live in that type of ceteris paribus world. The more the government does, the weaker we know it actually is. The government is responding to weakness, not curing it. So we go back and forth with China because as the global economy continues to get worse, which pulls and drags and exerts a downward force on China, governments in China respond, which gets everybody excited. And there is a short run burst of activity in the Chinese economy, which only seems to, in the very near term, support the idea that the stimulus is working to get everyone excited all over again, to say China has turned a corner. And then the next economic data point comes in a couple months later, and it's disappointment all over again, because the stimulus doesn't work. It's only ever media hype. In recent weeks and recent months, the Chinese have indeed stepped up their government support to the economy. Not only are they talking up everything in everything under the sun, particularly if it has to do with the private economy, they can't mention private firms more than they have over the last couple months. There are the usual Keynesian stimulus packages too. The government just recently, last month, announced that it was going to remove the very strict 3% deficit limit for this year. In fact, they were, going to, they were going to let it ride all the way up to 3.8%, which headlines all around the world. China is back, baby. Well, again, latest economic data shows that it's not. So government stimulus has been happening in increasing fashion, which if you read nothing more than the mainstream media, you think that China is booming again, when in fact, the more you see the Chinese do, the worse it must be in China. And the worse it must be in China, that tells you something also about the rest of the world. Global trade recession, global recession, globally synchronized. So we've got, we got more economic data from China that is unexpectedly disappointing. We've got developments in financial markets. We've got a bit of a mystery in the China Yuan, given everything that I've just told you, as well as what I'm going to tell you. So there's a lot to go over where it relates to China, because unfortunately for the Chinese, everything continues to happen in the wrong direction. I think a good place to start and really observe this stimulus cycle, the weakening general economy, but the stimulus short run cycles that we've seen, let's start with commodities. 
Something like Shanghai Steel, which are rebar futures that are traded in Shanghai. What you see with Shanghai Steel is, first of all, the big reopening last year, which created an enormous amount of hype, uh, which, which we all remember was supposedly the fix to China's economic situation. Because most people assumed that the problem in China was related to the pandemic Po pandemic politics. Therefore, removing the pandemic politics would likewise remove the economic restraint. Removing the pandemic restraints would let China's economy free to fly, which was what many people were expecting. And it did lead to a short run uh, increase in commodity prices, as well as, again, some economic activity. But it didn't last long, nor did it go very far. So you had Shanghai steel prices that rebounded, rebar prices that rebounded earlier this year. But then again, along with the China's yuan weakness, global economic weakness, rebar futures prices declined around April and May. And they've been stuck at a low level really all throughout the summer as Beijing ramped up its stimulus rhetoric and eventually its, act, its activities, especially in borrowing funds. So while it had been stuck around 3,600 yuan to the ton during the summertime, in October, when the gov central government announced that they were going to do more actual stimulus, raising their budget deficit limit to 3.8%, even if it's for building water conservancies, rebar futures started to rise again. And since... Uh, that middle part of October up until around November 21st, the futures price went from 3,600 to 4,000, which was the highest in many months, a multi-month high. While it sounds good, in the actual wider context of recent history, that's not that much of a move at all. And certainly not for the amount of hype that has gone into the, uh, talking about and really talking up the government's efforts to rescue the economy. If you thought the government was really going to get in there and be successful at restarting the economy, really get building, property developers turn around, building stuff all over the place, get the private economy investing again, rebar futures would be first and foremost surging, not just in the way that they had last year during the reopening hype, but even more than last year's reopening hype. Instead, this year's stimulus hype has been all hype. Rebar futures are up because the government is going to be doing some activity. They're going to be building sewers, roads, and water conservancy projects that no one in China actually needs. But that the market is saying outside of that short run increase in activity, government activity, it's not likely to lead to a longer term solution. It's not likely to turn around the big drop off in property development, investments among manufacturers who are experiencing the global trade recession, the downside of all that. So rebar futures, even though they're up during this stimulus cycle, you might actually be rolling over here, it's not up all that much and certainly not, not as much as you would expect for a successful program. And it's not just steel rebar futures. You can see the same thing in copper prices, for example. Copper prices have steadied from their low levels just a couple of months ago. They've moved up to around $3.80 per pound in the United States, largely as a reflection of some activity like steel from the Chinese government, but not, near, not nearly enough to offset the continuing internal problems in China as well as the global economic weakness. And another one. Crude oil. Just today, OPEC announced finally they're going to cut production and it seems like they have an agreement on doing so. Yet, what are oil prices doing? After rebounding on the rumors of additional production cuts, oil prices in the U.S. and around the world are falling again. Weak economic circumstances. Not only are oil prices falling, they're still in contango despite, for, despite further production cuts. Weak, globally synchronized demand. China as well as the rest of the world. China wants the rest of the world to help get it out of its rut, while the rest of the world really needs China to help avoid worsening recession conditions. Globally synchronized and globally self-reinforcing. Last night, the Chinese reported on their monthly PMIs for November. And they were, of course, unexpectedly weak. Downward numbers across the board. Here's what Bloomberg had to say about the PMIs. Activity in China's manufacturing and services sector shrank in November, adding to expectations for additional government support for the economy as it struggles 
to regain steam. That's the consistent theme throughout this year, really throughout the last several years in China. It always struggles to regain steam no matter what is done to help support it. Now, the media always says the government support is going to work, and then it struggles to regain steam anyway. Today's PMI reading will further raise the expectations toward policy report, said the chief economist at some firm in Hong Kong. Fiscal policy will be under the spotlight and takes the center stage over the coming year. Well, it's been taking the spotlight for many months now to no effect. Instead, we get this unexpectedly weak economic data. The PMI, the manufacturing PMI, fell to 49.4 from 49.5. That's continuing to go lower, continuing to be low under 50. The big one, new orders, contracting there too. But new export orders, they've gotten really weak here. 46.3 in the month of November, which suggests worsening demand around the rest of the world, which China really doesn't need right now. China could really use a boost, and instead it's getting recession conditions. Input prices were down to a five-month low, just above 50, while output prices or selling prices, those were actually contracting for the second straight month, indicating again weak demand inside of China as well as for export to outside of China. Globally synchronized problems. Non-manufacturing, which to many people is the more shocking number, especially given, given what you'll see is the historical context for these numbers, these PMI numbers, Non-manufacturing at 50.2, that's the worst in 11 months, going back to the lockdowns. And you think about how bad 50.2 is. 50.2 in China for non-manufacturing, not only is that like a lockdown number, go back to 2008. The worst number during the Great Recession was December 2008, and that was 50.8. So here we are in November 2023 with Beijing supporting the economy and the non-manufacturing PMI is already again worse than it was at any point in 2008 and 2009. China's economy is in big trouble here. Orders again below 50 at 47.2. Foreign orders, foreign demand, 46.8, another incredibly weak number where it comes to foreign lack of foreign support for the Chinese economy. Employment, 46.9, so weak employment and conditions, both manufacturing and more so services in China. And the activity index fell below 50 for the first time this year. And the activity index looking more like a lockdown month than anything else. And of course, there were no lockdowns in China in November this year. In addition to the recent statistics on manufacturing and services, earlier this month, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange in China, it's a Chinese government agency responsible for foreign exchange, they reported foreign direct investment as well as other balance of payment figures, and buried in the details was a pretty shocking result. That was an 11.8 billion decrease in foreign direct investment liabilities, outflows. It was the first quarterly outflow during the third quarter of this year in the entire series history. And there's been a sharp drop off this year. And what that suggests, what that strongly implies, is that businesses outside of China are picking up stakes and going home. They're leaving China because they don't believe in the economic circumstances. Furthermore, they don't like the political stuff that's going on there either because the two go together. Political support for the economy comes from economic support for the political angle. So you have weak economy internally, weak economy externally, businesses acting on risk aversion saying we're leaving China. So if we have the first quarterly decline in foreign direct investment liabilities in modern Chinese history, another marker that shows China's economy continues to get worse, not better. doesn't matter what Beijing does. This leaves us with a bit of a mystery because everything that I've talked about in this video so far, you would associate with a weaker China's yuan. The exchange value, which had been going down all throughout this year, really since January, when it became clear the original reopening was going to fail, China's yuan kept going lower and lower. In fact, during September, it got to be the lowest exchange value it had been in more than 15 years, going back to early 2008. Since then, however, 
The Chinese have been trying to support the currency in the same way they're trying to support the economy, though with very limited success. China's yuan popped in early November, it got from, from 731 to 726 around November 6th, but that was, that was around the time the US dollar exchange value started to go down with other currencies around the world. So we could chalk that up to just the dollar weakening for short run characteristics or short run parameters. But then after falling again to 729 in the middle part of November, suddenly China's yuan made an absolutely enormous move, not lower, as you, ex as you might expect, given all the economic and financial circumstances, and we haven't even touched on the property bubble and dollar defaults and all that stuff, all of the things that you would expect to push China's yuan lower, instead it popped massively higher, got all the way to 7.11 to the dollar by November 21st. Since then, it's been a tiny bit weaker, but it's been hanging in there around 7.15, 7.14, 7.13, even 7.12, which is... Yes, the dollar around the rest of the with, with currencies around the rest of the world has been weaker, but not to that, not to nearly that extent. For example, you look at compare CNY with its former twin, JPY, the Jap Japanese yen. The Japanese yen has rebounded from its real low late last month, but to nowhere near the same extent you see in China's yuan. Another corroborating factor that we would expect to see if strength in China's yuan was reflecting actual money inflows, a turnaround in China's economy, stimulus actually working, uh, the global economy itself working and turning around, becoming a stronger China's yuan, we would expect to see Hong Kong's Hang Seng stock index surge. And while it was up in that early part of November period, that window there, it went from around 17,000 to almost 18,000, really 17,900, since then, the Hang Seng has retreated all over again, and just last night was below 17,000 for most of the day, got back to around 17,000. But incredibly weak Hong Kong stocks, which are consistent with the incredibly weak Chinese economy that's getting worse, not better, as you might expect given the China's yuan's strength. So there's a bit of a mystery here. Yes, the dollar is weaker, and that's sort of the background behind it, but it seems like maybe the government authorities took advantage of that dollar weakness to pile in and intervene to push China's yuan even higher than any other currency around the world. It certainly doesn't appear to be economic or financial strength. So China's yuan aside, China could really use some external strength to help support its internal economy that continues to struggle. The global recession is worse than people fear, and the Chinese can see it in their own economic circumstances, and the Chinese economy isn't going to help either itself or the rest of the world avoid recession. Instead, China is a reflection of globally synchronized. As I briefly mentioned, China is a mess financially as well as economically. For my last video on the financial disaster in China, that's the one linked below me. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and Eurodollar University subscribers. Until next time, take care.